that mom is pulling in the driveway and you didn't do your chores yet, <laughs> right? We've all been there before, right? We forget things all the time. It's just a reality of how we are. And we're forgetful with stuff regarding our faith too, right? We, we forget to read our Bible. We forget to pray. We forget to come together sometimes, right? If, if we're not in the routine of coming to things, of, of reading our Bible, of praying, then we just We've, it's tough to remember to do it. And it's not just the practices that we have in our faith that we forget to do. We tend to forget God and who he is. We, we forget in the midst of hardship that God is good. When we're, uh, we're, we forget his love for us and his mercy when we're in the midst of sin struggles. We forget about who God is all the time. And this isn't like a modern problem, right? This isn't like, you know, first world, 21st century Christians, like we we just are lazy and we forget about God all the time, right? This has been a problem from the get-go. This has always been an issue for followers of God. Throughout the Bible, uh, we see example after example after example of God demonstrating his power in incredible ways to people, and then shortly after, they forget about his goodness, they forget about his love, they forget about his compassion, his mercy, they forget who he is. It's, It's a problem that's common for people. We just forget who God is, or even worse, we we just ignore God altogether. We abandon him to worship false gods. In uh, the book of Exodus, there's a great example of this where we see God freeing uh, these Hebrew slaves from their enslavement in Egypt. And he, he helps them to flee this uh, country, this empire in Egypt. And he's, they're fleeing from the most powerful army in the entire world, right? And God helps them to flee from this country by literally taking a sea and splitting it in half, Right? They walk through on dry ground where there once was a sea. And then once they get to the other side, God uh, guides them through this desert wilderness as a pillar of cloud that stretches from the sky to the ground. And then at nighttime, that pillar of cloud becomes a pillar of fire. He's visible to them. He's guiding them. Finally, then he, he comes and he meets with the Hebrew people's leader named Moses. And Moses meets with him on top of a mountain and gives him the Ten Commandments. It's like this code of conduct for the newly formed people of God. Now, during all of this, down below the mountain, the people had constructed for themselves this giant statue of a cow made of gold. And they started literally bowing down to this golden statue as their God. When moments ago, they had seen God part a sea for them. They saw God help them to escape from that slavery from the most powerful empire on earth. He he had done all of these incredible, powerful things for them, and they forgot who he was and started worshiping a false god. We forget who God is, and we need reminded. We, We just can't seem to remember that God created a perfect world for us out of love. We, we can't seem to remember that despite our rebellion against, us, against him, God found a way to bring us back to him. We can't seem to remember that Jesus' death paid for our sins. We can't seem to remember the hope that we have because God promises to come back and fix all of the brokenness and evil we see in the world. We just can't seem to remember the goodness and the power of the gospel. And so that's what this series, Remember, is all about. It's about remembering that, reminding ourselves the impact of the gospel. And so we are going to spend the next several weeks looking at the gospel and reminding ourselves of it. Sometimes we can think to ourselves, you know, I'm, I'm already a Christian or I've been in the church for a long time. I know what the gospel is. I don't need reminded, but, but clearly we do. And so we're going to take a look at the gospel And break it down into four pieces called creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. We're going to break it into those four pieces each week. And tonight we're going to look at creation. So we are going to go ahead and look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, which is the creation account. Now, it is a long passage. And so it would probably be difficult for you guys to listen to me drone on the whole time as I read the whole thing to you. So what I want to do instead 
is something a little bit different than what we normally do. You guys are going to read it at your table, around your table together. So uh, you have a page at your table that has the whole thing on there, but I know most of you have the Bible app on your phone. You can open up to Genesis 1 on there. And I want you guys to read from Genesis 1-1 all the way to chapter 2, verse 3. And you guys are going to have some time to do this together. So let me pray for you before you read, and then you guys will have some time to read around your tables. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here tonight. Uh, to be able to gather together with other high school students and leaders, uh, to be able to draw close to you. Uh, As we take time to study the creation tonight, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand it, to be able to feel the love that you give to us and you demonstrated for us through the creation, and that you would help us to be changed by that knowledge. Help us to understand what we're about to read and uh, be able to take this time to heart. We ask for your help in this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, take some time to read Genesis 1 through 2, 3.
don't want to waste any time, raise your hand if you're still reading. Nobody was still reading? Cool. All right. So uh, Genesis chapter 1, the creation account. So uh, most of you, if not all of you, have read this or heard this before. And it's about God creating the universe and the order in which everything was created. Uh, And it's absolutely an important piece of the gospel. And we're going to be talking about that tonight. But if we're just going to talk about the day, each day, what happened, and uh, talk about that, it's, it's basic. It's boring. You guys can handle more than that. So uh, I want to show you tonight why I think that the creation account uh, teaches us that creation is a demonstration of God's love. Creation is a demonstration of God's love. So let's, let's dive into that. Let's figure out why I think that it's, it's showing that to us. Well, the first piece to realize here is that uh, the creation account, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, what you guys just read is it's not a lab report, right? It's, it's very poetic in nature. You guys just read something that was poetic and beautiful. And uh, you can see this by, by the, uh, the openings and the refrains that are a part of it, right? Each day starts with, and God said, right? We see that in uh, chapter 1, verse 3. We also see it in chapter 1, verse 6. And so on and so forth, throughout the entire chapter, we see that happening over and over and over again. Every day starts with, and God said, and then he creates something. He does something, right? But we also see this refrain at the end of each day. And there was evening, and there was morning, the whatever day it was, right? And this happens every time, right? We see it all throughout the chapter. And there was evening, and there was morning, the blank day. Now, when I say that, this is poetic, right? I'm not saying here that, that it's inaccurate or that it's not historical. That's not what I'm saying. Instead, I'm trying to emphasize that this, there is a lesson within here. It's not just information for you to know in your head, right? There's more to it, and the author intended for there to be more to it than just understanding how God created the universe and the order in which he created the universe, The reality is that this is a creation account from an Eastern culture, right? Now, we are not Eastern people. We're Western people, right? Uh, If if you've done any sort of world culture studies in school or anything like that, you're familiar that things are different on our side of the world than the other side of the world. And so people learn differently in Eastern culture too. See, uh, in Eastern society, they want to learn by discovery, They want to learn by discovery. See, uh, in Western society, we're so used to that you you make a point and you you, uh, argue it by by showing evidence and by making claims and by arguing your point to try and prove that you are correct. But in Eastern society, you learn more by discovery. And so somewhere in this story is something, a treasure that the author is trying to help you to discover. And... That treasure is Sabbath rest. That treasure is Sabbath rest. Now, in order to demonstrate that, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about what happened in the creation and what happened each day. See, during creation, in the first three days, go ahead and pull that up for me, Julia. In the first three days, we see ordering, right? God took what was chaotic and brought order to it. So day one, light and darkness were separated and ordered. Day two, water and sky were separated and ordered. Day three, land and sea were separated and ordered. All three of those days have this common theme of order. And then you move into the second three days, and they were filling what was ordered in the first three days. See, day four, you're filling the light and the darkness with sun, moon, and stars. Day five is filling the water and the sky with fish and birds. Day six is filling the land and the sea with animals and humans. It's supposed to be this way. They're trying to draw us to something because something sticks out here. We have these first three days and these second three days that pair so nicely, this parallelism that's happening here. But day seven sticks out, and it's where we rest. 
right? And we see this again happening, uh, this pointing out of rest in the very center of the passage, right? The very middle of the passage. Now, if you went and you counted words in your, what, what I just handed out to you, it wouldn't be the same because in English, it wasn't the original language, right? But in Hebrew, the very center of this passage is verse 14, and it's a specific word, right? Verse 14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be signs and for seasons and for the days and years. Now, the specific word that it's uh, the center of this passage is that seasons, which in Hebrew is a word called moed. Now, moed is translated a few different ways in the Bible. Sometimes it's seasons, like we saw in this passage. Sometimes it's sacred days. But most frequently, it's translated as Sabbath. Now, uh, again, it's pointing to rest by the center of this passage. Again, we see that refrain, right? There is evening and there is morning. The day starts with rest. The day starts with evening where you rest, right? So over and over again, this passage is pointing to rest. Now, I know that... You can listen to me right now and hear all these things, and it sounds like I'm crazy. I'm, I'm grasping at straws, and I'm making biblical conspiracies, right? It sounds nuts, but this is legit, right? This is actu- an actual uh, literary tool that Eastern, ancient Eastern writers would use that's called chiasm. And chiasm is using the literary structure of what they're writing to point and emphasize something in particular. Right? And these examples that I gave you are normal and common uses of chiasm that we see in the Bible and other ancient writings. Now, chiasm is pointing to something. And like I'm telling you here, chiasm in this passage is pointing to Sabbath rest. So remember, the goal of Eastern writers to help, of Eastern writing is to help you to discover a lesson, to be able to figure something out by discovering that treasure not just be convinced of the information. So the author is pointing us to rest. But the question becomes, why is rest such a great treasure to discover? Why is rest such a great treasure to discover? Well, you have to think about who was the original audience that this was written to, right? It was written and it was described and and told to Hebrew slaves, who for the past 400 years of their people's history had been slaves in Egypt and their worth was based upon how many bricks they could produce in a day. And how many days and hours does a slave work? Always. How often does a slave get rest? Never, right? So rest is incredibly important to slaves. And so the people that heard this for the first time, it was giving them a beautiful truth that God values rest and he values you having rest. So this was a beautiful truth for them, right? We see the same thing with uh, the, the backwards refrain, right? We talked earlier about how it's backwards for us. It's evening and then it's morning, right? For us, we think about morning and evening, but for an ancient Hebrew person, the Jewish Sabbath begins at sundown on the day before. It begins with evening, right? And that's because they want to start their day with rest, right? You don't start the day. Your day isn't started by what you do and what you produce. Instead, it's started by resting. Each day begins with rest. So with this this beauty and this value that rest has, let's take a look at the day of rest that's described in Genesis 2, 1 and 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And there was evening, oh wait, where is it? Right? There, there is no refrain there. So what's, what's going on? There's no evening and morning the seventh day. Why isn't it there? I promise you, I didn't put it on the screen, but you can look in your Bibles. That refrain doesn't happen on the seventh day. Why is that? 
It's because the Sabbath rest that God had on the seventh day continues on forever. The seventh day continues on forever. God is internally enjoying his good creation that he had made. Right? God is in his Sabbath rest, and he wants us to join in with him on that Sabbath rest. Now, another question that you may have is, why does God rest? Like, is God tired? Is he sleepy? Does he need to take a nap? Right? Like, he, he worked really hard in creation, and he needs to recover from that? Of course not, right? That, that's not the nature of God. He doesn't tire. So why would he rest? It's not because he needs to take a break, but it's because he has done everything that he needs to do for creation. He has completely finished everything of creation. How many of you guys have ever seen the Sistine Chapel before, or a picture of it even? Right? Here's a a picture that I have of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, It's this chapel in uh, Italy. I should have checked that. I'm sorry. Uh, but Michelangelo painted it, and it is absolutely gorgeous. I've never been to it, uh, but uh, I've seen lots of pictures, and there's all these incredible works within it, right? There's a lot of very famous uh, paintings that are within the Sistine Chapel. And so you go inside of this room, and you can see the windows on either side of the room because the whole ceiling is painted with these absolute masterpiece paintings, right? And so at some point... As Michelangelo was painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he had to have thought to himself, there's nothing else I can do, right? I've I've painted everything that I can paint. If I take even one more stroke of my brush, I'm going to make it worse than it is right now. It's finished. All I can do is sit back and enjoy this masterpiece that I've created. And that's exactly how God feels about his creation. He looked at it on the seventh day and he said, this is everything that I can do. I'm not holding out. This is beautiful. This is good. I'm going to enjoy it, right? God didn't rest because he was sleepy. He was enjoying his good creation. God made something good and so he, that's worth enjoying and he wants you to take part of that with him. So when we think about creation and we think about rest, how do we fit in with all this, right? We're not ancient Hebrew slaves. We're, we're 21st century people sitting in a church that never would have existed those thousands of years ago, right? So how do we relate with this? How do we fit into this story? Well, I think a big piece of it, taking what they learned and what the value that they saw in rest and seeing that in ourselves is this, that your value is not based in what you produce, but who you are. Your value is not in what you produce, but who you are. See, who are you according to the story of the Bible? Who are you according to the story of creation? You're the best part of God's creation, made in his image. He looked at you when he called everything else good, and he said, you are very good. You're not valuable because of what you do. You're valuable because God created you and he created something good. And God's not holding out on you, right? He made a good creation. He's satisfied with all of it, including you. God loves you. There's nothing you need to earn that love. There's nothing you can do to earn that love. He loves you because he made something that he loves. And rest is so important because it is a reminder of God's love for us. See, we forget this constantly. We feel dirty and we feel undeserving of God's love. But how different would your life be if you would just remember that God loves you because he created something he loves? If, if you really truly knew this, if you understood this, If you would remember this, it would change the way that we view ourselves. It would greatly impact the the anxiety and depression that so many of us deal with. It would so radically change the self-doubt that we have in ourselves. It would change the way we view ourselves. It would change the way that we view others because God loves us so radically that he did something beautiful and he created something beautiful. If we really remembered this, if we remember how God created something he loves, then it would change the way that we live. 
And that's the power of the gospel. That's the power of remembering who God is and what he's done. So we're going to take some time to discuss this and break it down at our tables. Uh, I have some questions that we'll put up on the screen, and you're going to discuss this with each other at your tables to kind of process what it looks like for you to take this idea of rest and put it into your life.